it's been 10 years, so if you can, can you take us back to when you were discovered at the Denny's? And if you remember anything, I mean, you were only eight years old, mm -hmm. but do you remember that feeling of, I'm safe? I, I do remember that feeling of, of, I'm safe, but at the same time, it was just, I think I was so focused, well, sad about my family, but so focused on, you know, where are my oldest brothers or where's my dad and, you know, just stuff like that. Um, I was I was happy to be in a safe place, but there was still that part of me that's like, well, what if this happens again? Do you remember when you were spotted? Do you remember that moment? Do you remember when someone said, "Are you? What happened?" Um, well, the cop came up to us and he asked me what my name was, and I just I remember feeling really scared to say anything. Um, I remember looking at Joseph Duncan for like a um, almost like like a permission to answer the question. Um, yeah, I was just really scared. Did he give you that permission? Um, well, when I had looked over at him, he kind of like nodded his head, like, yeah, go ahead, you know? Because I, I think that everyone knew who I was. It was just a matter of getting that confirmation that it was. Do you think he wanted you to be rescued? Um, sometimes, like, I, I do think about it and sometimes I don't know if he would necessarily um, be that nice to, you know, do that for me. But at the same time, it, I think that he brought me to so many public places for a reason. I don't know, you know, what was going through his head or, or what, but I think that him bringing me to public places, there was a reason for it. Yeah, I think you're right. So let's talk about the next few years. You were just eight, mm -hmm. so you had a lot to overcome. What were those next few months like with your dad? Um, did you get the help you needed? Do you remember it all? I mean, you were so little. Um, I remember not being in school for a while. I remember um, kind of just not being able to really watch TV because my dad wanted to protect me from what was on there, and uh, he didn't want me to have to see Duncan again. Um, but I do remember it was just everyone wanted to love on me and just be there with me. And um, it was just, I think it was just like a time for my family to get back um, to not normal because things could never really be normal after that, but just kind of get back into a motion of we need to move on with our lives and, you know, start somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. So during that time, did you get the help you needed in terms of, did you see a counselor? Did you get to talk about it? Did you talk about it with dad? How did you let that all out? Or could you even at that time? Um, I did. I was seeing a counselor that I really, really loved. Um, but that came to an end when she was telling people um, outside of our sessions what was going on in the sessions. Oh. Um, and so my dad didn't want me to talk to her anymore. He was worried about me and um, what could happen for me if things like that did get out. So I went to another person and then after that I was just kind of like I'm so tired of talking about it and I'm so tired of um, having to relive it. I just wanted to focus mainly on what the rest of my life was going to be. I was a very future oriented person. I hated looking back on my past. Already? Yeah. So tell me, did you feel like you had the support you needed in that community? Did you get the support that you think you needed looking back? Yeah, I, I definitely do, and if it wasn't something that my family could do for me, my family would reach out and other people would, you know, step in and help us, which I appreciated a lot, because there wasn't ever a time that I was really alone or, you know, and that, and that always made me feel better, just being around other people and just feeling like I had that sense of security. Absolutely. Now, after you were rescued, was there a debriefing time where you had to speak with investigators quite a bit? Do you recall any of that? Um, yeah, I remember um, I, the night that they had found me, they took me into a back room and I was sitting on a chair and they were just asking me questions and I would close my eyes and be like, I'm thinking, but I'd really be sleeping. I was super tired and just exhausted and I just, I didn't even really want to answer the questions. I just wanted to sleep and I wanted them to do it a different time, but it was so set on like, we need to get we need to get answers tonight so that we can move forward with what we need to do tomorrow. And uh, yeah, so I do. I do remember that whole whole entire interview that I did with the cops. I guess a lot of people would wonder, do you remember what happened during that time? We're not going to talk about it, but do you remember it? Uh, is it still vivid? Or I think people are hoping 
I hope she's forgotten a lot of that. What would you say to those people? Um, well, I think that things that happen like that, you can't really forget about them. Um, I think that the images will always be vivid in your mind. Um, or I know that they are in my mind um, vivid and I remember a lot of little details still. I mean, some aren't always there or, um, you know, I look back on other um, things that have been talked about like when I was younger and I'd be like, oh, okay, I remember that now, but I had forgotten about it, you know, all these years. But I mean, there's like a lot of the little intricate details and stuff, I remember some of those too. So are you able to push them or do they, they sink and stay? Are you able to push those memories away? Um, I mean, I, I could push them away, but a lot of the times I don't really like to push them away because um, I guess I feel like if I were to push them away, it would be like avoiding, you know, what had happened to me. And I'm one of those people that like to face, you know, like to face reality and be like, well, yeah, that did happen to me. Um, it's just a matter of working through it, just being able to feel that and not really letting it sink in and stay to where it hurts me, but to not push it away to where I just completely feel like it never happened. You're so healthy in that way. How do you think you got there at such a young age? Um, I think that I had a I had help with um, some great people that were able to get me there because I, I haven't always really thought about it like that and I've always kind of I mean used outside things to um, I guess picture it a different way or to look at it a different way but um, I had, you know, when I had went to a, a treatment place, um, they helped me, you know, they helped me, helped me get there, and it's actually helped me a lot since. That's um, great. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about those years of your life, because you did fall into drugs, correct? Mm -hmm. Tell us about when that started, and do you think it was because of, was it a symptom of what happened? Was it a way to stuff it away? How did you fall into that? <laughs> um, I think it was more like, I just wanted to be a normal teenage girl, and... Um, so many people were like, oh, Shasta, you know, Shasta this, Shasta that. And it was just like, I got so tired of people bringing that to me. And when I finally, you know, met a group of friends, I was 12 years old. It was when I had started middle school is when things started to slip. Um, I found a group of friends that didn't see me like that. They just wanted me to hang out with them. And um, that's when I, you know, started, you know, smoking marijuana and drinking and it actually made me feel really good because I didn't feel like I had to focus on um, all the stuff that was going on in my life at that point. I mean, there was still court stuff going on with Joseph Duncan. There was still um, counseling that I had to do and just a lot of stuff. And at, you know, 12 years old, being like a pre-teenager, I yeah. just I really felt like I didn't fit in anywhere. And um, I was going through um, a lot of, um, like, almost like sense of security issues. Um, I didn't feel good about myself or the person that I was. I didn't, you know, I thought I was maybe too fat or ugly, you know, just kind of going through, like, I guess that crisis that a lot of teenage girls go through. So I think that that all kind of pushed me over the edge a little bit. How serious did the drugs get? Was it just marijuana and alcohol or did it go farther than that? Um, no, when I was um, 14, that was my first time ever doing meth. And for four years after that, it was, you know, meth, um, I experienced with other drugs too, um, a lot of party drugs, you know, acid, uh, mushrooms, you know, just stuff like that. I just, um, pretty much anything I could get my hands on that made me feel like a different person, I would do. How did you finally get help or realize you needed help? Um, well, I mean, I, it did take me going to a juvenile detention center to get that help and um, the judge was very honest with me and she's like, Shasta, I feel like you do have um, a lot of help you can give people and I feel like you're way better than what you're being and so she was like I'm gonna send you to a correctional facility um, you get out pretty much when you change your life and um, she was like and I hope that later you can look back and thank me she was like I've had I've had a lot of kids go there that actually came out and you know wanted to thank me because their life is so much better and so much different so, and I was really upset because I was like, no, my friends and yeah. the drugs and my family and all this stuff. Um, but I went and I was there for over a year and actually got some like really, really good help. That's the place that I'm talking about. Um, yeah. Met a lot of girls that had been through a lot of the stuff that I had or had been through similar drug experiences and 
were able to help me see that my life didn't have to be that. How did you wind up here in the Treasure Valley? And are you open about telling people that you're now part of our community? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Um, I got here because when I was done with St. Anthony, um, it was just kind of, um, I was looking at a lot of court stuff and they were telling me, you know, I don't think that going back to Coeur d'Alene is necessarily the best option for you because of all the people that you know there and um, people that got acquainted with the druggy Shasta and they're just like, if I feel like if we were to send you home and go back to that same environment, you could fall back um, really fast. And I had agreed. And so um, I actually came to a step-down program that is in the Treasure Valley area and was there for probably about four or five months. And they helped me get on my feet, get a new place, and um, just work on my sobriety. And I got to meet a lot of other you know, girls that came in and out of there that live in the same area. So it kind of helped me with the foundation for friends and stuff like that. Do you feel welcomed here? Do you feel like this is a home for you? Do you feel like you can be, do you want to be incognito? Do you want to be Shasta here? How does that all work? Um, I mean, it's always like, it's always, it always feels good to kind of live a normal lifestyle just without everybody being like, oh my God, you're Shasta. I mean, since I have done some interviews, I have gotten that a little bit, but it seems like a lot of people here are more kind of um, like they they see me and they recognize me, but they're just kind of like let's let her live her life. And then, I mean, it it was like that up in northern Idaho and Coeur d'Alene too. But there there was a lot of people that's like, oh my God, you know, they just kind of maybe almost wanted to meet me so that they can say that they met me. And I've never really met anybody here that has done that. So good, I'm glad to hear that. So you yeah. feel welcomed here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Okay. Great. Um, let's talk about your life now. Okay. So you're living here in Nampa. Mm -hmm. You have a great apartment. You're pregnant. Mm -hmm. Tell us about this baby. Um, well, I on f on Saturday I'll be 26 weeks um, pregnant with my son. <laughs> um, his name's Lorenzo, and um, I don't know. It's just it's completely different. I feel I feel like um, my whole mindset has changed. It's kind of like I'm very focused on my son and bringing him into a good environment that every time I make a decision or every time I do something I'm like well how is this going to impact my family you know it's just kind of like I think that mother instinct is already kicking in I mean I feel like I've always had that in a sense because you know I have a lot of nieces and nephews that I've always been protective over. So tell us what this baby means to you I know it's a very special thing in your life it's new hope new life there's so much sim symbolism in this baby mm -hmm. tell us about that um, I guess my, my hope for my son is that I can show him, um, I definitely don't want to be one of those parents that don't tell their kids anything and kind of, you know, I want, I want him to know what can happen in life. I want him to know, you know, like as he gets older what happened to me and, you know, just kind of like the struggle with that and um, I also want him to know that like I want to teach him right with his friends and I want him to just always stay on the right track. You know, I want him to know that education is very important because I don't know where I'd be today if I hadn't graduated high school. So I guess like I just, um, I want to teach him all the right things I've done with my life and the, the paths that I've actually went on. Um, and I hope that he can learn, you know, from my mistakes and the good things that I've done. I just um, kind of want to give him the, you know, because like when I was younger, I did have a pretty hard life. Um, you know, we were, you know, money was a very big issue. And I just, I don't ever really want my son to struggle like that. I don't want him to, you know, have to have the power run out, you know, and stuff. I just, I always want him to be taken care of. Yeah. Well, I think you'll make sure that happens. Yeah. I do. I guess for a long, a long time, like I always had this feeling that I could not have kids. And, you know, like um, it's been kind of... Um, no one's ever like straight up told me that I couldn't, but it's just been kind of, you know, I've been told that it would be hard for you to, you know, just have, you know, have a baby with all the trauma that you've been through and, and stuff like that. So in my head, I was just like, I can't have kids at all. And then when, um, when I did get pregnant, I was just like, oh my gosh, you know, like it was a huge surprise. Like I didn't even think that it could happen. And then, um, so and like now in that way, when I think of, yeah, you know, I am going to have a baby. I still know that just Duncan did not do damage to me that is life long. You know what I mean? I mean, obviously, emotionally, yes, 
there are going to be those things because I'm always going to miss my mom or I'm always going to miss my family, but he did not make a permanent mark on my life. And it's, I mean, that's just good to know that I can still bring life into this world and not have to um, have that hate in my heart for someone that I don't even need in my life anymore. So He didn't steal that from you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, he stole my innocence and he stole my family from me, but he's not going to steal the fact that I can, you know, bring children into this world. And that makes me really happy. But it's got to be a struggle. I mean, being this young and having this much responsibility, do yeah. you feel like financially it's a struggle sometimes? Um, yeah, sometimes it's just kind of like, okay, well, um, what are we going to do when we need this? You know, I mean, we always have what we need, but sometimes it's just a little scary when, um, you know, you have a baby on the way and you still need so much stuff. You have an interest in being a counselor one day and mm -hmm. inspiring others and helping them. Yeah. Why is that something close to your heart? Why do you want to help others in that way? Um, I think I would like to be a counselor or, you know, therapist or help someone um, or help other people um, because I've had so many therapists and counselors that have just not really been helpful. Kind of just like, oh, how, how do you feel about that? Like, they never really gave me advice on, you know, what I should, you know. Um, it's almost like I've, I've had a lot of counselors that don't have experience with, um, you know, either a troubled kid or um, kids that have gone through trauma. Um, and it's just kind of like they're very inexperienced with that and mm -hmm. I want to be one of those experienced counselors that have been through a lot and so whenever a kid you know comes at me with something it's not a huge surprise and I'm not like shocked to hear it you know what would you say I mean I know it's hard to imagine but there were thousands of people hundreds of thousands of people worried about you mm -hmm. so w how are you today and how are you doing um, I'm I feel like I'm doing pretty good um, I think that, I mean, I do have, you know, bouts where I go through depression. You know, I have PTSD and bipolar disorder. I have a lot of stuff going on in my life. So, you know, sometimes when things get stressful, it's very stressful. Even, like, one little teeny tiny yeah. piece of information can just, it kind of feels like the end of the world sometimes. But um, I feel like I do have the support to get, be able to get through it, through those situations and um, talk about, you know what's going on in my life. So when you hear that so many people care about you and, and know you, people who actually care, you mm -hmm. know, in, in their hearts, and you've, you've held a place in their hearts all these years, what's, what does that feel like? It like helps restore like my, the faith that I have in yes. others. And it's not like, because I used to see everyone as just like, oh, you're just here for bad intentions. That's what I thought about everybody. Um, but I mean, these past couple years, just been like, you know what, I see it in a whole, a whole different way. Now. That's so great. You've had a lot of healing. Yeah, I have. Uh, let's talk about your memories. I know you have a lot of wonderful memories of your family um, before this incident, I'm sure. Do you have a lot of those with you? And are you able to let those memories from before the incident push out the memories after? Yeah. Um, I do remember um, my mom w loved music. She loved listening to music and doing karaoke and singing and, you know, just stuff like that. And um, I think that that's carried on, like, with me. Um, I love music, and I love singing and doing that type of stuff. And um, I remember just being younger when it was just me and my mom. You know, the boys were at school, and I was too young. We were just dancing around the living room and um, have fun like that. And my mom was huge. Like, she always wanted to, like, she always wanted to um, cook and have food on the table every night when everyone was home, and we could eat as a family. And so I helped her cook a lot. What about Dylan? Do you have a lot of good memories of your childhood together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, me and uh, Dylan were only 16 months apart. So, I mean, in a lot of cases, me and him would just kind of click up, and we were very, very, very close. It, there wasn't really a time that we'd really fight or get in any big scuffs. Like, we were just always very understanding. It, it, it was almost just like as, you know, like how twins are sometimes, where they're just very close, and... Um, have that kind of connection. That was kind of how me and Dylan were, even though we're not twins or anything. But, I mean, we were just very, very close. And um, we loved, you know, riding bikes and being on a scooter or just even going to the store with my mom. Me and him were just, like, very attached to my mom. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's why me and him were so close is because we shared that love for our mom. Very special. Yeah. And, of course, we can't leave out Slade and uh -huh. honor him. <laughs> 
What, what memories do you have of him? Um, I remember that me and him used to butt heads so much because <laughs> he, was, he was so much older and he never really, he wanted to do things with my older brothers and we always wanted him to play with us. And, um, but I do remember that he loved to be outside and do outside things. He liked to hang out with his friends and he liked to go to school to see his friends. And um, he, was, he was a very social kid. I mean, he was shy, but he wanted to... Um, I think that he was like one of those people that wanted to make a difference in the world, but he didn't know how, you know, quite yet. Yeah. He was still trying to grasp so much. But I do remember um, a lot about him because it, it kind of, that hits my heart more with Slade um, because I feel like there was so many times that, you know, we fought and we could have had that time together that we didn't get. And it's kind of like a regret in my mind, but I know that I can't go back and change that or... Um, I don't even think that I would take those times back. Um, but I do wish that me and him would have been a little bit closer than we were. Yes. And what about your mom's boyfriend? Were you close with him? Was he a father figure to you? or? Um, yeah, we were really, I mean, we were close to Mark. Um, he would take us to, you know, go crawdadding and um, fishing and stuff like that. I mean, he, he made it a point to tell us, you know, I'm not your dad. I'm not going to step in and take your dad's place. He was like, but I'm here for you know, support. I love your mom and I'm here to, you know, support you guys as a family. So how do you keep them close? How do you keep your mom close, your brothers close? How do you keep them close all these years later? Um, I think it's just, um, I think when, if I ever think about like the bad memories of the things that I've seen, um, it does kind of push them away. Um, but I keep them close, you know, I pray and, you know, um, you know, I, I pray sometimes I talk to them when I'm having a hard time where, you know, I talk to them in my head sometimes or I just think about their faces a lot. And I try to, I mean, it's hard for me because I don't really remember their voices or anything, but I try to remember. And mm -hmm. so the more I try to remember, it's like the more comes in. And I have dreams about my mom a lot. So I think that's what keeps her close. And, you know, I do, you know, have that tattoo of my mom where it's just like, I feel like she's always with me and, um, you know, I see a lot of my brothers and, and my nephews and stuff like that. So they're just always close. What do you want Lorenzo to know about your family? What do you want him to, to know? Um, I definitely want him to, like, know about them and know of them. And I want them to, or I want him to know that, um, you know, that he has a grandma in heaven that watches him and, you know, just wants the best for him. And, um, like, I want him to know that he has guardian angels that are always going to constantly be looking over him and being there for him. Let's talk about Joseph Duncan for a moment. Do you know where the process is now in terms of what's happening with him? Do you keep up on that in terms of the court system or do you just kind of push it? Um, I don't, I guess I don't really, um, like I've heard a lot of things and um, I've talked to a couple people that, I mean, I know that, I know which prison he's in. I kind of know that, um, I know that he kind of has like little supporters on his side. I know that there's, I, do, I just don't really follow like the court, the mm -hmm. court thing a whole lot. Just because when I was younger, it was just kind of something that um, we were very set on me not testifying. And so, and you know, my dad didn't ever want to come home and tell me what was going on with the court because he wanted me to just kind of be able to um, move on with my life. There was, um, someone in my stay at St. Anthony that had, you know, told me, because I was just like, I can't believe that someone could do that to a family. And, um, you know, I was just so stuck on that. And um, I think it was a staff member that told me, they were like, Shasta, if you're, if you're feeling that way and you're still, you know, thinking that much about him and the person that he is, they're like, he, he's still controlling your life. If you're, you know, letting him like if you're thinking about him on a on a daily basis and all the wrong that he's done like there's you know it he's winning you know what i mean um and if he's obviously hurting you and making you feel like that still and he's you know in prison and he can't hurt you anymore then he's still victimizing you and he that's what he wants and so when someone said that i was like oh my god you're so right you know like i can't i can't think about it like that anymore and so i pushed and pushed and got that help and it's just kind of like i got to a point where it's just like, I don't care who he is, and he's not on my mind, you know, every day, and I don't really, I mean, what he had done was done, and it was wrong, and, um, 
Like, I got to the point where, like, him as a person does not make me feel bad for who I am. And so by that, he just he just doesn't define my life anymore. Uh, he's asked for appeals. I know that. And I know that he got he um, got sentenced to the death penalty. And I don't know where that stands. I don't know if that's ever really going to be carried out in a long time. You know, so I just, I mean, I'm kind of in limbo with that. But What do you think is the right punishment for him? Rotting in prison? <laughs> the death penalty, what does Shasta want to see? I agree with the death penalty, but I wish it was kind of more like the older days death penalties. I just, I think that, I guess, I know that two wrongs don't make a right, but I think that he should be able to feel what he put others through. Your resilience, I mean, your strength, I mean, coming out of this, I think a lot of people say, how can anyone get through that? How yeah. can anyone survive it? You've probably heard that several times. <laughs> how, how do you do it? How have you done it? Um, I think that it's just kind of, um, I know that I lived for a reason and I know that there's a reason that I'm on this planet still and that I know that I'm here to help other people. Um, so whenever I feel like giving up, I mean, especially now, I feel like if I give up, you know, I have my son there and he's gonna see me give up and I can't let that happen, you know, because mm -hmm. I've had a lot of people in my life give up and, you know, just kind of walk out and go down a not so good road and it I mean it hurt me inside you know to see that and I don't ever want my son to hurt in that way of knowing that you know his mom gave up or that she can't be strong anymore because a lot of people would say you should write a book about your life and what you've overcome mm -hmm. but you're only 19 you still yeah. have a lot left of that book to yeah. live so tell me about that idea do you really you really do want to write a book yeah I mean um, I think my inspiration was Elizabeth Smart I've read her books and um, just, I know that um, I read her newer one when I was in St. Anthony and I really loved it and it really wanted, like it really made me realize, well, hey, you know, maybe I should write a book because her book really helped me, you know, and it's just kind of like um, we, I mean, me and her, you know, are very different situations, but kind of, you know, maybe the similar feelings that we had went through and um, um, maybe just the thoughts kind of you know, we're almost compatible, I guess, you know, so and just being able to know that someone else felt the same way during their capture and, you know, just stuff like that. I think that if, um, if I can read a book and be inspired by it, then I feel like other people could read a book and be really inspired by it too. They would be. They would be. Have you connected with her? Um, I met her a couple, I think it was in 2012, I met her. Um, I went to a Women Helping Women convention and I met her. Did she I mean, know who just, you were? Um, yeah, yeah. It was just it was just for like five minutes because she had to go to somewhere else and do another speech. But um, I really liked her. Um, I thought that she, I mean, you could just tell that she was like nothing could really tear her down. Like she was just so goal oriented and just wanted to help others. Let's talk about your dad briefly and your relationship with him. Mm -hmm. What do you want to share about that? Um, I think that um, nobody else really supports me like my dad does I mean even even if I'm like even if I'm like even if my dad doesn't agree with my thought process he'll be like I see where you're coming from though like I see the good intentions that you have behind that thought process but let's look at it this way you know like he supports me in ways that um, a lot of people couldn't just the fact that he's my dad and that I mean he went through my addiction with me you know just because um, it was me, the one that was addicted. I mean, my whole family had to be put through that and had to deal with that, you know. So, um, and a lot of people were just like, we can't deal, we can't deal with Shasta no more. But my dad was, you know, the one to stay by my side and push for me to get help. And, um, you know, he just, my dad never gave up on me, and that's always meant something to me. Um, and since, you know, he is my dad, and we've been through this traumatic experience as a family, it's just kind of like I respect my dad in that way, you know. I mean, he lost his kids, he lost his ex-wife, you know. Like that hurts him too, you know. So just, um, it's kind of like the situation with Elizabeth Smart, like knowing that he hurts kind of in the same way that I do um, makes me want to help him and be there for him. So, I mean, we are very close, like, like we have a very close bond. My dad has taken what has happened to him and actually made a lot out of it. Um, he just um, has pushed through so much, you know, even though, um, you know, 
my dad is like I feel like he's my hero he's the ultimate survivor because he survived something that happened with his family and was able to you know push through that but he also is surviving in his own you know surviving from cancer but I mean he's in remission and doing really good so so is there anything you want people to know that we haven't discussed about you or about is there anything you want to say to people out there who are watching and saying, I've always had love for this girl, you know, through the years and wondered where she is? <clears throat> what would you want to say to people out there who are genuine in wanting to help Shasta? Um, I just want to say thank you um, and that I appreciate all the support that I get. So I appreciate all the supporters that I have and I appreciate the people that can see that, yeah, I have gone through an addiction, but I'm still this is still a success story, you know, I'm still a good person.